Добре, гости, самият дарен компания, който се казва Trendalize, като сега наши гости ще разкажете много повече за нея, също с това, което правят. Това, което аз ще направя сега, да ни представя на кратко и да видим за какво ще става в момента. Между всичко, след представянето ще бъде на английски, да се разползвам това във върна български. Така че вие също имате някакви въпроси, особено по време на QA и сесия търна, и опитайте да кажем на английски. Сега е правилно съвсем да успява, така е правилно ще му помогне да проведе вместо него, но все пак да опитаме да бъде на английски. Иначе за нашите гости, значи първо доктор Руслав Котолов и да е в отсън, тези дамата са основателите на компанията, като всеки тях ще разкажа много повече за себе си. В такъв вече бъдат и двете презентации, които днес ще чуем. Така че давам на нашата гостинница. Благодаря. Аз бъдам да ви казвам, че върши за инвестиция и върши за добре продукти. Аз съм бъдам за 25 години от тази кампания, така че не знам много от тези бъдам в сфера. Аз бъдам в софтуер индустрия за около 20 години. Аз бъдам, когато Java came и почнахте да върши и почнахте да върши и почнахте да върши. And in the last 15 years, I've been in, the, in an area of software known as business intelligence and analytics. And today, this is worldwide about a $16 billion market, and it's expected to grow to $45 billion in the next five years. Uh, what business intelligence and analytics is, all the reports, all your bank statements, phone statements, pension plans, utilities billing, they come from systems that generate those reports, and on top of it is another layer that is dashboards, visualizations, text analytics, sentiment analysis, and then you move to the more advanced types of stages of predictive analytics and uh, optimization, etc. So it is a very wide industry in terms of the software tools, technologies that have been developed. Trendalize now that they've talked about it, it's taken it to a different level. We decided that in this market space of analysis and analytics, there is a new need that's emerging because of all the sensor devices that capture very granular data. So now sensors allow us to capture data on seconds, milliseconds, minutes, etc. And as you start capturing such a detailed data, essentially it allows us to understand better what's happening. So if we go back to the centuries, how did humans evolve? They started hunting, and hunting is an activity when they start tracking animals, and that's a time series data. The animal does X, Y, and Z. You see a pattern, you set a trap, and you have dinner on the pet, right? That's as simple as it is. So we are doing similar things with the sensor data. When it happens, we want to understand the patterns in it, and some of them are called motifs, and motifs mean that They tell you the story, why something fails or why something succeeds. And if you know that, naturally, you can optimize it, you can monitor it across from many other devices and etc. Use cases, if you look at engines, they run, 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 and then they fail. And any time they fail, it's very costly to repair it. So what you want to do is you want to understand certain patterns and say, as it starts getting there and there, monitor these thousands or hundreds of thousands of engines and as soon as something starts coming close to failing, stop the engine and go and repair it. Uh, why is it entirely different? It's because it's a, the volume is tremendous and the granularity. These are the two variables that make it so difficult. So to give you just an example, an airplane has 22,000 sensors. A military ship has 100,000 sensors. A robotic arm has 160 sensors. So that's really The gist behind it, and Dave is going to give you an example and explain in more detail how this whole thing works. But we think that it's a new kind of analytics, and that's where we focus on it specifically. Now, I was asked here to take uh, a specific aspect of the speech and what I'm going to talk about. And it's called data monetization. How many of you have heard about data monetization? Anyone? One person. Shall I ask you what it means? No. Don't ask. <laughs> Why do we build software? To make money. Yeah, that's what it is. Exactly. We build software to make money. So the number one question is, how do we make money with all that? How do we make money with data? So let me just step back a little bit and ask you something else so we can get to why data is something that can make money. What is your favorite app on the phone? Something. 
Yeah. Or a big company that you know and you're fascinated with. Tell me one company in the world that inspires you. You say, if I want to build a company, I want to build this. Well... Uber? Okay. No, no, I didn't tell you that. <laughs> Uber was banned in Bulgaria. Yeah. Tell me something else. Facebook. Facebook. Okay. One, somebody else. Which one? Google. Facebook. Google. At the back. The girl at the back with the code. Your favorite company. I have Facebook, I have Google. IBM. One more. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> of those three companies that you mentioned, do they own any physical assets? Ford Motor Company has an assembly lines that move cars. Of anything? Does, does Google have anything? Do they have raw materials? Do they get aluminum to process? No. What does Google process? Data. What does Facebook process? Data. Okay, what was the third one I forgot? IBM. Does IBM process? What does IBM? Data process on a large scale. So the point here is that, especially if you take Google and Facebook, they don't have any physical assets. All they have and all they make money with is pure data. Right? So that changes the nature of business. For a hundred years, for the last hundred years, business has been built around making money by taking raw materials and converting them into finished products. They would make desks, sell desks, and that made money. Today, the companies that do that have a much lower valuations than the companies that make money with that. And to give you an example of how this is changing the world and relates to us, take for example a company like General Electric, how many of you are familiar with it? Why are they, what are they famous for? One thing. Insurance. No. Insurance, no, they sell that business. <laughs> they didn't sell it. What are they famous for? Dishwashers. I get a, I get a the light bulb. The light bulb. That's what started it. Edison invented the light bulb and it became General Electric. And now, and now they make everything. They make medical equipment, they make airplane engines, they make uh, power train engines, they make all these things that take steel and turn it into engines, right? Samsung. They were? They were the same. Samsung. Well, Samsung, they grew up in the same way, yes. So what happened with General Electric five years ago? The new CEO came and said, hmm, I'm making all these engines, but, and I sell them, but my profits keep coming down and down. On the other hand, there are all these companies that analyze what the engines and the data are doing, and their profits are going up and up and up. So the companies that take the data and analyze the performance of the engines are actually making more money than General Electric is making by producing the engines. And so they said, okay, if we go like that, the companies that own the data are going to steal our profits and will be marginalized. So we'll kind of lose the business in our competitive position. So what they did, they said and said, okay, we're going to reinvent how products are sold. So rather than selling products, we're going to sell products as a service. So I'm not going to sell you, he knows about that, I'm not going to sell you the airplane engine, I'm going to send you the services of the airplane engine. And so I'm going to optimize it, make it run better for you and do things like that. So when he got this brilliant idea, he said, what do I do now? And he went back and asked his guy, said, what do I have to do in order to really make this happen? And he, they said, okay, the G has to become a software. And that's very fundamental change. Somebody who has been used to manage factories and many stuff, suddenly realizes that they have to become a software company. And he said, I have to be the number 10 software company in the world in five years. And that's what G is today. They actually have put a tremendous amount of effort in it. They have a very good software development facility in Palo Alto, in California. They have acquired the people, the talent, etc. And what's more interesting is, and now they generate actually as a 
last year five billion dollars from soft. So it's a significant shift of what they do. And the point here is that data, they realize that data has become the most important asset and they change their operations and what they do accordingly so they can compete in this world. And um, so it, it is a very interesting approach and it's, it's something that every industry goes through various transitions. So realizing that thing uh, is a big change. So that brings me to a point that really and, uh, is important. Data is and data is going to be put on the accounting books at one day. And once it's put on the accounting books, that's going to trigger a whole change of how we operate and what we do and how we manage. Uh, more interestingly enough is that since GE went into and did that with the software, they went back to their to the valley, and everyone in Silicon Valley was like, you would never be able to find good software engineers because everybody wants to work for Facebook and Snapchat and what else, WhatsApp, and etc. And the most interesting change that happened actually, G went to the, to the software community and said, do you really want to be building the next social app or do you want to change how life is going on and change what we do with engines and change how we go into space and change what's going on with the medical equipment? So do we want to still keep being and obsessing about the social apps and the next big thing in the social media space or do we want really to get start solving the really, really big problems of humanity? And we've taken the same approach about that in Trendalyze and said we want to allow and give easy tools for analysis and visualization and monitoring so that all these data collected by engines, medical devices and etc. can be analyzed and used to improve the operations of the machines, uh, the environmental conditions, or the healthcare of people and the habits of people. So it's a very important the angle you take of looking at that. But the last one that I want to make is, is uh, very important. We, up until now, as an industry and as a community of uh, software engineers and uh, specialists, we never thought about data monetization. Data monetization was the last thing that IT talked about. In fact, if you go into many organizations, there is a chief um, CIO, chief information officer, chief technology officer. And when you ask them what they do, they say, ah, oh, we're waiting for business to give us the requirements. We're going to build something for that. So they actually work infrastructure managers. They act like project managers. And what started to happen is in many organizations, they started New companies, startups coming up and saying, give me your data. We just want to look at it. And then they'll take their data, they'll build applications, and they sell them back to the companies. And what that indicated is that these companies didn't know the value of their data. So I'm going to ask you a question. Why did the cabs in New York City or anywhere around the world didn't invent Uber? They had all the data. The traffic controllers could see every cab on the screens in their offices. The dispatchers knew where every car is at any moment. And yet, they failed to invent Uber. They had the technology, they had everything out there, but they didn't do it. A startup came and stole their business, right? Why? Because nobody thought that data can produce or should produce money. And that's very important as you're studying my point. Uh, final point here is that uh, what we are lacking today as a skill uh, in general in the software industry uh, and in, in the economy in general are people with interdisciplinary skills. Not just somebody who is a software engineer, uh, not somebody who is just a statistician or a data scientist or etc., but somebody who has the skills and understands the science behind making software, the coding, etc., but also has knowledge of the business and very often of human psychology and interaction skills so that these data products, which are very complex, can be designed. And this is what we're kind of advocating and encouraging. Don't do an education we do in 
general, the world has become very good at specializing people to do one thing. But for the first time, actually the skills that are needed are interdisciplinary. So I would encourage you to explore and become really specialists in the field, of, uh, your fields of computer science, etc. But also take related field, whether it's business or design or psychology. Learn those because that's going to open your views about what you do with the data and the software that you design. Most software is still being designed as a hobby because it's interesting to code, because it's a great technological software coding problem that I need to solve. But how to apply it in real life is an afterthought. And that's why we have such a humongous failure of startups uh, in the world today. So with this, uh, do you want to have questions now or after? Maybe two questions and then I'll hand it off to Dave and then then we can get more discussions later. Or maybe I'll open it with one question. So does data monetization interest you or not? Yeah. Yes. yes. How many people? Oh good, that's good. Do we have a pragmatic community of software developers? That's great. <laughs> okay, two questions and then I'm ending it today. No questions? Okay, we'll talk after that over pizza and uh, beer. Okay? Okay. Um, what we're targeting, what LEAF is really targeting, 
are the, the users of these data and data services. Uh, these could be uh, policy makers in government, it could be commercial organizations, for example, uh, people that are building, uh, building construction that want to look at uh, solar power. Uh, it could be housing associations, hospitals that want to look at energy, um, solar, um, but a particular area of focus is around health, public health. Uh, whether they're talking about mosquito-borne diseases, air quality, uh, a lot of the environment has uh, a big impact on health uh, and it's actually created a lot of deaths uh, in, in different countries, including Bulgaria. So there's a lot of emphasis around how, how to use uh, this data and these data services uh, for better uh, either monetization or providing better uh, health uh, analysis improving improve the quality of health in, in the country. So to really tell you what you see here, you don't see computer science, data scientists here. These are all largely business type people, policy makers, academics, business analysts, uh, finance people, and, and so on. So what's the issue? Why, why do you need to do a project like this? Why, why do you need to to build a, a product uh, or solution like this. Um, so imagine you, you have a project, like for example, we, we, we looked at one uh, whereby uh, we were looking at uh, certain mosquito-borne, uh, yellow tiger uh, mosquito-borne viruses and modeling those. Uh, what do you have to go through? Well, the first thing is you've got to get your data. You've got to find all your data. It's all in different uh, place sources of data, some proprietary, some open, it's all in the different formats, you've got to locate them, you've got to analyze them, there are a lot of data quality, data completeness issues, you've got to integrate the data, uh, merge the data, match the data, put it into some sort of database for analytics. So if you take, for example, one data source um, that we deal with uh, from the Met Office, uh, it actually, uh, we have to merge many, many files from a binary format and then pivot the data where we take 180 columns and pivot it so it's then something that's more like a relational type view and then union those files together so we then add what would be basically multiple measure columns. So there's a lot of, a lot of work in preparation. Put it into some sort of analytical database like Spark, um, build your analytics, build your visualizations, Build your models, for example, mosquito diseases I mentioned, uh, deploy that and maintain it. And these are all things you do, and the next project comes and they do it all over again. And the next project comes and they do it all over again. Uh, and what we were looking at is how uh, we pull that together to provide a framework. And, and one of the key um, advantages of this approach is the expert opinion of the data. right? The, um, the view itself, probably nobody in this room studies environmental sciences and certainly hasn't studied uh, climate change models or disease models, air quality models, air, water, water quality models, uh, mosquito borne viruses like the Zika virus, which is having a huge devastation throughout that's Central America and into the United States now. Uh, so one of the uh, key things really is the analysis of data from these world-class experts. So you say, here's the data already integrated, here are the models, and the data has been verified by people that understand it. So instead of giving raw data, what you're giving are the, the services. And it's much like what Rado was talking about. If you talk of Facebook, as an example, that's quoted, Facebook provides a whole analytics service where you can look at how many, how many people are looking at you on Facebook, liking you this, reading this, commenting on that, and they use it for advertising, monetization. And this is exactly the same, except it's with an environmental data. Big, big market for this, uh, growth market. Um, just recently there's been the, the World Forum, uh, the World Economic Forum, and uh, the, there was people like, for example, uh, President Obama said that climate change is the biggest threat to, to the world. Not nuclear, not Russia, not, you know, not whatever, said the biggest threat to the world, the humanity, is climate change, which probably is true. Uh, some people would say nuclear bombs, maybe more. But anyway, you can see uh, there's a big market around this, 
And what we're, what we're doing, we're bringing some of this technology from Bulgaria into this, is providing a platform by which these experts can apply their domain knowledge to the data, look at build models simply, simple uh, approach to building models with web-based tools, and deploy them with some advanced visualization. So I'll move, move to the next page. Um, these are some of the, uh, the data sets that we deal with. Environmental data we get from the Met Office in the UK, NASA, Global, and this is gridded data. So data that's at one, one kilometer square environmental data. Uh, that could look at things like participation, sun, pressure, temperature, etc., etc. Uh, global, global data as well as specifically to the UK. Uh, satellite data, uh, proprietary data, particularly around energy, uh, mapping, mapping data. Uh, we deal with weather stations, so when I was talking about the Internet of Things, which is really where the trendalized Bulgaria development is really focused around the IoT, uh, weather stations, uh, feeding data, um, and other sources of, of data, for example, Twitter uh, is, a, is a big factor here where well, you actually see it, that you can look at the forecast uh, that you had of your weather, the actual weather, and then what your forecast would have been if you would not used the forecast service but used Twitter to analyse the data. And this might be a bit hard to read, um, but this is, a, uh, this is a map of the UK. Uh, we've taken 50, 50, uh, 55 years worth of data, uh, which was in that horrendously complex uh, gridded structure. Uh, so it's, it's 55 years of gridded data, one kilometer square, uh, with each file has 180 columns that pivoted, and then the files are merged together, which then allows me to put, look at it as a time series of sunshine, a time, a time series of precipitation, a time series of rainfall, a time series of humidity, and then merge it together. So any grid level I can look at for any particular day, month, year, uh, I can look at um, uh, that particular, you know, what's the sunshine, what's the... And then I can integrate the, the weather station feeds, which is the real-time streaming data, I can integrate that at the grid level. So if I know, for example, uh, you know, Liverpool somewhere here, uh, Portland Down, which is a military place we're working, is somewhere down here, I can, I can grid their data so I can have live feeds. Uh, what this, is, this actually is, is a pretty advanced model that's used uh, to look at mosquito um, sites. Uh, so there's specific climate models that can project where mosquitoes uh, will, will, uh, mosquito borne diseases will come. The UK obviously has a fairly cold climate, but the, the simple thing with the mosquitoes is actually uh, warm and wet weather. And sunshine is another factor as well. Uh, so it's a simple relatively simple model, but it, it actually deals with a uh, fairly complex way of processing the data because you start by saying, uh, a simple, very simplest one would say, which grids had an average temperature greater than zero in the month of January for that year? So you rule everything else out. Uh, and then you look at average uh, temperature for that grid, and you look at uh, total rainfall. Uh, so you need a certain amount of wetness, a certain amount of warmness, and you don't have freezing cold weather in January, which kills the mosquitoes off. And then you can combine sunlight, and then what that does, it gives you a score of high, medium, low, and you, could, you can start to do it. And then you can play this over time. You can see the effect of climate change, which is quite interesting. We made a YouTube video where we played it over, over 40 years ago, how the climate change was affecting bringing mosquito-borne viruses in. Uh, this is the area of the Zika virus, which is uh, Quite a, uh, so that's some of the technology, uh, let me just, uh, or some of the solutions. Uh, let me just show the last part, I'm just going to show you the, no, unfortunately it's like cut off a little bit on the chart. I don't know if you can, can you move over a little bit? Yeah, it's a uh, limitation from the project. Well, I'm sure we will make the, the copies of this player, but I'll, uh, okay, I'll start back. Um, so, well, this, this class is around Apache Spark and um, related technologies. So this solution that we're talking about is built with Apache Spark, 
uh, time and one, one sixth work, uh, and it has an Hadoop cluster behind it, uh, which is on IBM Open Data Platform, uh, which is basically like, the, uh, say, like 2.6 Apache. Um, you have a you have an IoT um, broker that's feeding the data in. So the first thing is you've got this broker, and there's actually two technologies there. There's an open source product called Mosquito, and I it's called Mosquito, uh, which is an NQTT broker that feeds uh, and it does a publish and subscribe model for, for NQTT and AMQP messages. Uh, and there's also Microsoft, one of the other, one of the stations is a Microsoft based solution. So Microsoft has a, an Azure IoT gateway, uh, which also supports MQTT. Uh, some of this is tied together with another, another tool called Node Red, which is uh, like an orchestration uh, tool for building processes for the IoT world. So you can, you can subscribe to data, transform data, and, and publish data. Uh, we use that to then publish uh, the data onto the Hadoop cluster. Uh, we did that with Flume, and we found out we really was a bit overkill using Flume, so we just published in files actually. So we, we kept collect the data out and published there. And then we have some, some jobs on here, the ETL jobs that merge those files, uh, and we store the event. Uh, data, so IoT event data is stored in the HDFS in JSON, JSON format. Um, this is a simplification of the architecture because there's actually a MongoDB in here as well because some other things feed through Mongo but don't want to sort of a JSON. Uh, so the, the reference data, uh, whether it's the net, net CDF or NC, which is a multi dimensional structure, the CSVs and JSON are all stored on this. The analytics part of it, which is the interesting part, where you see some of those charts that we showed you, um, that's on the Apache Spark. Uh, and what that allows you to do is uh, run um, SQL queries over this data and take advantage of things like machine, machine learning. Um, with the current version of Apache Spark, the 1.6, uh, there isn't a very good integration between Spark Streaming and Spark SQL. So what happens is you, you can use something like Kafka or Flume, or you can do it, you can just do it with files. But what you've got to do is you've ultimately got to integrate the streams into your data frames or your tables, so that you can run queries over these data sets. With um, Apache Spark 2.0, which is coming out this summer. Um, Spark SQL and Spark Streaming are integrated. So you'll be able to dynamically run a Spark SQL query over files and stream data. So some of what you see here with this, this part of it uh, will, is, will be replaced by Spark Streaming uh, at, that, in, at some point in the future. Uh, <coughs> but just replacing the ETL type uh, task. In the uh, Spark world, uh, you can use uh, Python, R, uh, you can use uh, Java and uh, Scala, and uh, you can also in the HD Insights Microsoft world, you can use all of the Microsoft uh, tools as well. So Microsoft uh, HD Insights has uh, the support for .NET type uh, development environments as well, uh, which some, some people like for that. Um, this, this is actually down to this feed you there from your weather stations. And we have three, three weather stations hooked up at the moment. One with, one with Microsoft and two with the, with the open source. And then we have the, the web applications that access the data. Um, one of those is, uh, is the visualization software that I showed you, which is like an IBM tool. And the other is the uh, use of a uh, notebook, the Jupyter notebook. Uh, which allows you to embed um, Python or Scala or any of those uh, and uh, D3 charts uh, to do some uh, visualization. We're also working with a very interesting uh, open source project right now called Aperture, um, which is a, a way of, of having layered, layered data uh, on, in the browser. So you can have uh, data at, say, the gridded level, the 
let's say at a country level, data at the county level, at the grid level, at the city level, and you can visualize a lot. You can, do, you can have the appearance that you visualize it a million points in the browser, but what you're actually doing is you're doing it at levels, and you've got these tiles, and you can sort of zoom in, and you're zooming into these particular areas. So we're doing that to replace the IBM tool for the, um, the visualization. Last thing that Rado, Rado mentioned, just to finish up, um, Rado mentioned Trendalyze, and what Trendalyze, where does Trendalyze fit in this? We haven't yet, we have a project in June where we're installing Trendalyze in here and in here. And what Trendalyze allows you to do, I should probably get Lisa to explain Trendalyze, uh, but Trendalyze um, allows the user to have a search paradigm, so like, almost like a Google, Google search uh, over the data. So when we now say, okay, here's a pattern uh, for, say, the mosquito example. Here was a certain rain, here was a certain uh, sun, here was a certain temperature, here's a certain pattern of interest. Can you now search my data to show me, in history, where did those patterns occur? Or could I, uh, for example, set a monitoring process in place where I now want to monitor my weather stations to say if those patterns are occurring now when I'm getting data from the weather station. I'm maybe getting data actually at one hertz from the weather station. We, we kind of concluded that, that the data at one hertz wasn't very useful, but you, we could produce it from the weather station. So we were taking it at five minutes, 10 minutes. But even at five minutes, 10 minutes, you're generating 144 points a day per, per measurement, you've got to say about 60 measures and you, you've got thousands of weather stations, so it's a lot of data. But you could now, now instead of somebody having to visualize it and go through charts and things like that, they could, they could specify a pattern that they're interested in and then the system could basically say, we'll search uh, when that data is available and no, notify you. And a lot of the users that we were talking about in the beginning, the, the policy makers, the financial people, the business people, as you move up the chain. And even in the university, when you start talking academics that are in environmental sciences, they're not computer scientists. So if you can give them a simple search-based interface, uh, that's really the, what they're looking for. Uh, and that's what we're doing. We take, we've taken a guy from, from Bulgaria, from, actually from uh, Plovdiv, who's in Liverpool, uh, will be implementing this, uh, so we'll have a, a test case for this. Trendalyze Bulgarian software running over this environment. Now, where it's heading from there is heading to New York. Uh, New York State uh, has a project called MesoNet, which is funded by the US federal government uh, for $24 million to automate all the weather stations in the state of New York uh, and collect all this data. And what New York is trying to do, they're looking at obviously security. Uh, climate, all the health things we talked about, but New York is also looking at how they're, how they're going to make money from this data. How, how can they take all this amount of weather, climate, environmental data they have and, and monetize that. Uh, and so they're looking for this sort of tooling and infrastructure that we, we're talking about. So that's where we're, um, where we're heading. Uh, Alexandra has been looking into some uh, cases where maybe this might be of interest in, in Bulgaria, but that hasn't, you know, we haven't progressed that yet. But certainly this is something where we're working in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia's got tremendous problems with air quality, um, mostly because of people burning uh, fuels uh, to cook. Um, and the government, said that the government allowed them to set fire to all the palm, palm trees. Uh, that causes a lot of pollution. But actually most of it is people cooking where they don't have like gas or electricity cooking. So they're cooking with like charcoal and things in, in their house, causing a lot and it's caused a lot of uh, diseases like asthma and other uh, COPD complications. So they're looking at, at it from an air quality uh, perspective. So a lot of applications for this, uh, this type of solution. So that's an example of Spark. Other areas that I'm looking at in Spark that I'm involved in is in the financial services area uh, where we're really using it as a, a platform for surveillance, global surveillance and uh, anti-money laundering, those sort of applications, know your customer, where they're just looking at Spark as a replacement for Hadoop, 
or Spark as a, or Spark as a replacement for Oracle and Teradata and things that they used typically used in the past. So essentially using it as a, a higher performing database technology uh, rather than the legacy type uh, relation. So that was a quick uh, quick overview of a project. And uh, if anybody's interested in working on the project, uh, there are some opportunities um, to work on this project, uh, either through collaboration or even in Liverpool. Liverpool's looking to expand the uh, expand the team. Some point. Liverpool. The university system in the UK uh, is a little different, mainly to Bulgaria, in that it, they're, they're, they're far more. Uh, the, the universities are more like businesses. Yes, they teach. They do research, but they do a lot more commercial um, business. So this is a commercial uh, commercial spin out, and uh, Liverpool Centre City is a completely commercial spin out. Um, so what Liverpool is looking at is that this being a source of revenue for them through their expertise, world class expertise, to, to get engaged in, in these, these other types of projects. So it's a, a means by which they're employing. Um, research assistants, postgrads, uh, but also a way that the university is actually generating revenue. A big chunk of their revenue is coming from commercial rather than tuition fees, which is the other, other source. I don't know if people have had much experience with, with Spark, with this class. I, I imagine you're just using Apache. Um, what we're finding is um, <coughs> that there's a lot of adoption of Spark by the major vendors, IBM, Microsoft, uh, hosted, you know, there's a company called Databricks, Amazon, everyone is getting into this Spark, not everybody, uh, everybody, but certainly a lot of the major providers are now trying to say they'll offer Spark as a service. So you don't have to worry about setting up your cluster and configuring you can just get a certain amount of capacity, compute capacity, storage, memory to run your, your Spark jobs. Um, and that's where we impressed with the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, but you also have Amazon Web Services and IBM's uh, a product from IBM called Bluemix, uh, which offers the same, same sort of uh, on-demand scaling of uh, Spark. There's a, there's a company called Databricks from uh, California that offers the same, uh, the same, same service. So, so if anybody's interested in that, uh, you can, um, Microsoft Azure and um, Databricks, you can get a free version. Uh, some of them are only like, with Azure you can, you can pretty much get an academic free version. Uh, with Databricks it's a limited, limited time that you get. I think 30 days, and then they expect you to pay for the Amazon web services that you use. But it's a quick way of getting um, access to Spark, so rather than having to install loads and loads of software and maintain them. Uh, anyway, that, that was really uh, what, I, what I was going to uh, talk about. So I think um, maybe some questions or comments or. They were very, very good. They don't ask any questions. Right? You have you have four now. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> I think I'm just going to bring in some beers. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, 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 we'll we'll make, maybe we'll make a little break and wait for our one. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's make a little break and then we'll enjoy it. Ten minutes. Yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Go to. Yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah. And then we'll do. No questions here. Pizza.